What's up everybody, excited about this interview today. A very good friend of mine. We've been friends for several years. He is a church planter. He pastors a very vibrant and thriving church in Orlando, Florida. He is suffering all year long in Orlando, Florida. Somebody's gotta suffer and do church there. But he's a church planter, leads an incredibly, incredibly thriving church. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this. I think, at least in my experience, that the dominant demographic seems to be relatively young. Yes. Correct. So you really tapped into the millennial yes. uh, demographic. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. But his name is David Jocks. He pastors the Kingdom Church in Orlando, Florida. It's a multi-site slash multi-congregational kind of thing he's got going. But thank you for being here, Pastor. And uh investing your time into these incredible students. So I want to talk a little bit, first of all, about you, okay. where you're from, your religious upbringing, your call to ministry. Well, I'm from Boston, believe it or not, a bean town, and I moved to Florida when I was 12, so I consider myself a Floridian. Yes. Because yes. I don't relate to the cold and the cloudiness, um, but I grew up in an interesting a Southern Baptist Haitian context. Mm. So it's, uh, it's uniquely different. It's not necessarily our traditional Southern Baptist context, but it has a Pentecostal slight flair, but not really. Unique uh, hybrid, I would say. Uh, my mom had me at 44, never dreamed she would have a child at this age. They weren't planning on it. And she asked God, why would I have a child? She had a dream that this child be a pastor. My mom and dad and grew up that's all I want to do is be a pastor. Everybody in grade school is like, I want to be a firefighter, police officer. I was like, I want to be a pastor. My grade school teacher told me, she's like, you're going to need to do something real with your life because that was before pastoring was a dominant uh, thing in our culture. So that's a little short about me. And I'm, I'm very excited about just the opportunity that we have to transform lives. Yeah. So your call to ministry, when did you discern it, sense it? recognize it, et cetera. At the age of six, I was playing uh, while other kids were playing sports. I would set up chairs and have a uh, fake church and act like I was preaching and mimicking my pastor. And my parents started noticing like this dream that they had is actually real because this kid is, he is dressing like a preacher. He's going to school like a preacher. At the age of 12, uh, one of the pastors at the church said, we don't have a record of you uh, giving your heart to God. And so we want to actually have you have an official moment so you can have for your records. Because I grew up in the church. I grew up serving at six years old. And so ministry was something that I just grafted to and, and was a lover of. That's interesting. So you moved to Florida. Yep. And when you were attending church in Florida. I was at First Haitian Baptist Church of Orlando, a traditional Southern Baptist church uh, with a little Pentecostal flair as it relates to pursuit of worship, prayer, uh, but uh, traditional, extremely traditional. And I left uh, First Haitian Baptist at the age of about 19. Uh, I wanted something a little different. Uh, a lot of times our theology was mixed with our culture. So for example- Haitian culture. Haitian you culture. Mean? So if you had tattoos, you're going straight to hell in the Haitian mm. culture. If you're a male with earrings, it was major problems. And so our ministry, I was a youth director, and in our culture, they consider you a youth until you're married. So we were having anywhere from 12 year olds to 30 year olds. And I, I just know I needed something more to be able to reach them, partly because we were getting put out of the church because we were attracting so many unchurched people. So that's how I ended up going to another church, a charismatic church in our city. Uh, God as a young adult minister there, and it was actually accidental. I was trying to lease their facility and when he came as a, the late Pastor Zachary Timms, when he came and spoke, he's like, you got a church. And he said, you, you told me you had kids. I was like, well, culturally, we're considered kids until we're married. So he was like, no, this is a young adult church. So I had the privilege and opportunity to work and serve there for four and a half years, just uh, merging what we had with what they had and, and being the young adult minister. So. And it was from that experience yeah. that you launched out and became a church planter. Yes. So that was, you were about four and a half years on right. staff there, Correct. working primarily with young adults. Yes. What was it that, so obviously you had this call to pastor. Yes. To pastoral ministry. But what was it about church planting 
that kind of intrigued you? Yeah, I was radical about church planning. I, I really believed that uh, we needed a vehicle to really minister to people in a different way. I view church from a different perspective as it relates to, I, I had a Southern Baptist background and I had a non-denominational charismatic, uh, think big, dream big mentality. So how can we merge the two? How can I get the best of both worlds and utilize that to be a word and power church? And so what we started was we started this church called the Kingdom Church with this identity that we'd be more of a, the word missional as Alan Hirsch uses it, as it relates to a place, not just we are static and that's where we are, but a movement of people that have uh, dreams, visions, and how do we use discipleship outside of just what we traditionally think of the local church is. If I'm a disciple of Jesus, all I am doing is preaching, teaching. Can I take that same abilities and use it in the marketplace? Can I take that same ability and use it as parenting? And so we want to create something that's more of a movement than just something that people gather at. You mentioned kind of in your upbringing, yes. the kind of church that you were in, yes. this um, hyper emphasis on morality. Yes. Earrings, yes. tattoos, etc. Yes. So did that in any way kind of shape and form the way you viewed discipleship? Because you mentioned that for you, disciple making involved taking a much more, I'm going to say, comprehensive approach yes. in terms of how do we shape people for mission, um, not just morally, right, but practically in terms of whatever mission feels they will find themselves in marketplace right. that you mentioned or entertainment, right. arts, et cetera. So was this something that, <laughs> this vantage point for you, was this something that just came strictly from reading some people like Hirsch yeah. or was it something <laughs> that you didn't like and yeah. what weren't fond of yeah. in the church you grew up in that contributed was, to that? I think it was a combination. I think Alan Hirsch gave language to what I, what I saw and what I, what I felt. Um, it was dominantly uh, my experience to say that if people are going to come to a local assembly, we have to first let them come. And so a lot of times we, we have these bar um, barriers that prohibit them from engaging in what we want them to learn. So in our church, it was heavy upon doctrine. You need to know the doctrine of the church. Well, you can't get people in the doctrine until you transform their heart. So what we are having was we we're people who were transformed um, they had head knowledge, but it never touched their heart. And so, yeah, they knew the scripture, but they didn't know how to live that out with their brother and sister. And so you, you reject the person that doesn't look like you, but yet you're saying scripture says we ought to love our brother and sister. Mm -hmm. So that for me, I wanted to find a practical way to still value theology, but also value the use of it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think the merging of two worlds was great for me because one place knew the word, the other place knew how to apply it. Mm -hmm. And and so I wanted to kind of get a hybrid of both. How do we empower people to know the word, but also how do we empower them to practically live it out Monday yeah. through Friday? Yeah, I think every tradition in some way, at least from leaders that, I, that I've spoken with that have grown up yeah. in whatever context, everyone has some kind of like, a, like dissonance right. between, uh, at the, every church does, yes. right? There's this dissonance between what we say we are and what we're doing right. and what, <laughs> what we actually are and what we're doing. And, you know, and I think growth and, and evolution right. kind of shrinks that gap and lessens that dissonance, but it's dissonance nonetheless. And I brought it up because I think there are times where we're unaware of how that shapes our theology Absolutely. and how it influences the way we see certain things. And I'm sure your experience, or I would imagine yes. your experience, influenced the way you see evangelism. Right. So when you hear the word evangelism, what comes to your mind? What does that mean for you? Yeah, it's. I read something that I thought was so interesting. I thought evangelism to me is walking with people, um, but it's, it's walking with them in a different way. So a lot of times we are not as prayerful as we ought to, so people could receive what we have to give. And so it, it's kind of like the threefold approach, prayer, kindness, and just really discipleship. Because at the end of the day, I can't teach you anything if you don't respect what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And I think there are ways that we can reach people's heart by not just opening up a book, but by being kind to them, meeting them where they are. So if I'm hungry, like Jesus sees the multitude, he, he doesn't teach them about mm -hmm. the gospel. He feeds them first. Mm -hmm. And the disciples were kind of thrown off because- wow. 
Why, why are we doing this? We should be speaking to them. But there are times where kindness is the avenue to reach people's heart. I've seen this lived out. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the things you, you, you guys do in terms of local missions yes. and the way you serve, the, one, the members of your congregation, yes. but two, your communities. Yes. So it seems to me, um, from what you're saying and then from what I know yes. about your leadership in church, is that Hirsch says this. Hirsch says that the gospel must first of all be embodied right. before it's transmitted. Right. And so for you, it seems seems to me like what you're saying is the embodiment of the gospel, right? So Mortimer Arias talks about the verbal proclamation right. of the kingdom and then the visible demonstration of the right. kingdom. So for you, when you think evangelism, you're thinking the embodiment of the gospel. I think we got a Jesus model is, a, is an incredible way that he takes disciples that had professions and he walks with them and he allows them to see how he lives to help transform the way they live. So my approach is if I see somebody that I think uh, we have the capacity to do great things and ministry together, it's taking the opportunity to invest time in them, getting into their world, learning what they value before I try to introduce what I value. And so I think that these are the commonplace because oftentimes we're having theological arguments to win people, but you can't you can win people in their mind, but you can't win them in the heart. And so my objective as it relates to evangelism is how do we engage people's world and really care where they are suffering and try to help them see other avenues that they may not even be aware of. That's interesting. That is so uh, such an interesting approach. And uh I've seen this lived out yeah. in, in your congregation. Um, as we're filming this, yes. we're in the midst of a government shutdown. Yeah. This past weekend, you just did something in your local church in yeah. response to that. What what did you do? Yeah, it was interesting. So we were um, in the process of receiving our offertory, and we thought, all right, is there anybody in the government that works here for, for the government? And actually, there wasn't. And we were like, well, thank God, there's <laughs> nobody that works for the government. Mm. But then we realize, as a, as a church, we're in the mm -hmm. inner city, and so we have to realize that when you're, I use the verse, to whom much is given, much is required in the aspect of, if I'm in the inner city, their problems become mine. And so what we did was, we asked the question, how many of you are in the negative in your bank account? So we had about six, and so we asked our congregation, listen, this is our opportunity to be hands and feet of Jesus. Uh, you may never pray for these people, you may never get to lay hands on them, but you can impact them existentially right at this moment. We were able to take six from the first service. Uh, they got $137 per person. The latter service, each person, our business owners really jumped in and we gave each person $243 per person. One lady stopped me and she said, you don't know how much this means to me. Like, I didn't know what I was going to do. And so oftentimes there are systems of oppression that they can't get out of. And sometimes they need a helping hand, but not just giving them money. We also instructed them on how not to go back. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times we're giving people fish and bread, but we're not empowering them and teaching them how to recreate that for themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so our approach is twofold. Yeah, we want to help everybody, but we also want to empower them to be able to help themselves. That's that's interesting. I, I, I think it's great, personally. I think that um, one of the things that you know I was thinking as you were talking about that was, when you mention contextually where you are, where your church is located, the demographic that, that you're serving, not exclusively, but a large part yes. being people who are from right. the inner city and dealing with a degree of disproportionate poverty yes. and uh, generational poverty and uh, not just poverty of resources, poverty of hope, yeah. which is which can be much more debilitating. Yeah. Right. When yeah. when, the, when there are no options, I, I, I think. I think this is something that's often overlooked, and that is the importance of exegeting a community yeah. before you engage in evangelism. So if you're going to attempt to embody the gospel, it's it's important, I think, to discern how the gospel is rich where they are poor. And that's not always, not always oh, financially. That's such a uh, powerful thought. We were, a year ago, We I was driving, I saw a homeless lady, and I decided, oh man, I need to help her. She didn't know I was a pastor. I said, will you be here next weekend? She said, yeah, I will be. So on Sunday, I bring my entire church out there. We bring a book bag full of money and supplies. And she looks at me and she says, I don't need this. She said, y'all are giving me money, but that's not what I need. 
And so a lot of times we're trying to help communities by giving them what we think they need as opposed to giving them what they really need. And she gave us an example. She said, well, what I could really use, because if I get this money, it's not going to be helpful for me. Number one, my community will know I got money and then I will become a threat and I could potentially be harmed because they knew I got money. So from that moment, it opened our eyes to realize that if we're going to go serve communities, we need to understand what they need without coming in with a predisposition of what we think they need. That's interesting, because what I hear you saying, Van, is when we think about living on mission and evangelism, right. specifically embodying the gospel, right. it requires that local churches, which are typically in the position of like institutional educators, yes. you come to the church to right. get taught. We do the teaching. Right. It seems to me that that experience suggests that before we can become the teacher, it requires that we also need to become the student right. to learn, again, exegete the culture, communities, engage with people to learn what some of these needs are and what are some of the best ways to utilize the gospel in word and deed to meet them. Yeah, you even look at the life of Jesus. Jesus was started off born in Nazareth, but he moves out to Capernaum. Capernaum is the place where all commerce is happening, things, traffic, people are there. Even when you follow Paul's ministry, it's, it's the same. We have to know where we're going and how to utilize where we are to help fulfill our mission. Because some missions we're trying to accomplish, we're not going to be successful trying to accomplish a Capernaum ministry in Nazareth. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 interesting. When you mention what happened Sunday, I'm thinking of all of these things historically throughout the years that I've seen you do. Yeah. Um, your church do. Cars yes. for members. Yes. And it's weird because you've got these two socioeconomic groups converging in one place. Yeah. And so... You have people who aren't from the inner city driving into the inner city for church. And you have people who are from the inner city coming to a local church in their community. And it's weird because you have the employers and the people who need jobs sitting in the same space. And it's this engagement. I've seen you do this. Engage those who are business owners and entrepreneurs um, in, a, in a number of different ways to, to kind of help assist, not just financially, but help assist um, the people there. So cars that you've done. Um, years ago when, when there was a great recession and gas was yep. through the roof, gas giveaways. What determines what some of these local mission initiatives look like for you? Are there a few things that you're, as a local church, you're committed to do all the time? Right. Or are the changing needs of the people in the community what determines what what that kind of mission at least yeah, looks like for you? Word, you said exegeting the culture. So we determine what does what's the pulse of our culture. Once we determine what the pulse of our culture is, that's where we move into the ministry of our culture. So oftentimes we're trying to do ministry that isn't the pulse of the culture at the current time. So we, we need to be um, intentional and intuitive on how do we meet that. So when we were talking to people who live in Central Florida, we don't have a great transit system as the Northeast. And so for someone to actually get a job uh, trying to take the bus, they're gonna be at least three hours to really get from one place to another. So the way that we find that we can really aid people is by providing transportation. And so transportation is critical uh, when you're trying to get from one place or another or pick up your kids at a certain time. Uh, one of the pieces that we have are one of our campuses, which is totally unique, is we have a transition house. So it's not your transition house where we let someone live in there um, and then we just say, well, we got a house that a member lives in. We, we allow them to live in there and pay rent for six months. They pay it to an escrow account. At the end of the six months, they get all of their money back. Each month they go through a credit class, they go through a finance class, they go through a budgeting class, they go through how to get out of debt, all of these things so that when they come out and they get that six month return, they know how to manage that. So a lot of times we're helping people and not developing their capacity. And so we're blessing them, but not enlarging their capacity. And so although we're blessing them, it's going right through their hands because they don't have the capacity to manage. 
you know, I think that's interesting. And uh, and the reason I'm saying that is you mentioned credit classes. You mentioned right. now there are, so your roots are kind of Southern Baptist. Yep. And these are things we're going to discuss yes. a little bit later in the class that there's this assumption in African-American uh, church history. Oh, there's a, there's an assumption people make about African-American church history that it's primarily monolithic right. and that everyone is Dr. King like, right. And that, right. <laughs> and that when you, you know, and when you start engaging in some of the activity that you, that you just mentioned, right. like financial literacy programming and, you know, purchasing a property to use for people to transition. Right. There are people who would put that in the, the social justice mm -hmm. category. And there's been some, just a lot of recent conversation right. about that yet uh, uh, recently. And I think it's, it's um, the myth is that in the African-American church, historically, people have always seen that kind of activity as a part of the mission of the church. Right. You know, some would say, you know, word rightfully preached, sacraments right. rightfully administered, you know, that's it. And others would, you know, particularly in the kind of context I grew up in, it was preach the gospel, right? right? <laughs> just, <Yes>. just, <laughs> just preach the gospel right. or just preach yeah. Jesus, you know? Yeah. And it's this, this sense that, that if the gospel is faithfully proclaimed, it's going to somehow automatically give people life skills right. that they need yeah. to to live functionally. So obviously, you see this a little differently, yeah. and you see what you're doing as a part of the mission of the church. You know, I lecture learning in seminary class. Uh, it was just a, a weird analogy a professor gave or a statement. He said it was a gentleman who was in seminary and they asked, how many of you love seminary? And, and everybody raised their hand and said, for one. And the professor's like, what is going on? What's wrong with you? He says, yeah, I don't like Christianity. And they said, well, why would you say, why are you even in the seminary class? He said, because Christians are notorious for taking you to the altar and leaving you there. Mm -hmm. And so for me, when I heard that statement, it really reframed how I look at how we minister to people. I do not want to lead people to an altar, tell them to accept Jesus. And they're excited, they're on fire, and they don't know what to do. So being born again is a rebirthing. So my ability is to reteach you the things. So sometimes you gotta unlearn what you learn. So we gotta reteach you about finance, reteach you about what the what the kingdom of God means as it relates to the reign of God in your heart, so forth and so on. So we what what I feel that my responsibility as a leader is is to relearn or re-educate those who may have not gotten that education. Yeah, that is that is out of the box. Uh, I'm sure, particularly for your yes. for your for your background, yes. you know. And so when I say out of the box, I mean, you know, when you think about particularly ministry, yes. um, um, contemporary ministry, and that being seen as a part of the uh, part and parcel to the mission of the church, I think that it's really dangerous to limit the gospel to just the good news, and not, you know, the good news about Jesus's work without also in some way highlighting the implications of that work and how the implications of that work impact every area of our life. Yeah. If you look at Jesus' life alone, uh, you talk about Jesus walks on the scene, sees there's a wedding, they don't have no wine, he meets that need. Uh, you talk about he sees someone sick, he meets that need. Now we may, if, if we can't physically heal somebody, we can still do health clinics. We can still provide the ways of Jesus, maybe in a different way. I mean, if, if Jesus or Paul were alive, they probably would not be writing letters. They probably would be emailing them. We can still take what we have the capacity to do and do greater works with those things and move the mission of Jesus forward. Interesting. So what are some of the things that you're doing? So I hear what your... I'm hearing some things about your ecclesiology. I'm hearing some things about your view of evangelism. Right. What are some of the, and I, I'm, we're hearing about some of the things your local church um, is doing. What are some of the things you are doing to kind of shape the theology of your members as it relates to oh, evangelism? Okay. 
So um, in the inner city, typically it's not for everybody exclusively, but to be able to get into seminary. And let, let me stop there. When you say inner city, okay, people don't think that the, I'm not right. People wouldn't think. Inner city exists in Orlando. Right. That's yeah. not the yeah. image yeah. Yeah. of Orlando we that, that people well. get. Yeah. yeah. We well. Disney is just one corridor, right? Yeah. Um, but when we when we think about theology, we try to become a center where people can learn about theology. We have Paul Copen coming to teach us God a moral monster. Uh, th there are things we have a systematic theology course going that we have partnered with Reform Theological Seminary to bring to the local inner city. Because if they can't come to you, then sometimes we got to go to them. And so as a church with our size, we need to leverage our influence to help form our practitioners and those that are trying to embody the gospel. And so there's a book that I read years ago. It's a good book called Represent. It says there's a... There's I know a, that guy. Yeah, he's a great guy. I know who wrote yeah. that book. There's, there's a, yeah. There's a Jesus in our head that doesn't match the scriptures. And so we don't want our members to grow up with of these ideas that they have made of Jesus that don't necessarily match who he is. Because a lot of times what makes relationships fail is an expectation that was never communicated. Yeah. Incredible. Your church is multi-site. Yes, sir. Why? It's, it's, it's a trend, yeah. right? It's a different and the, way. Though. Yeah. Uh, we do it a different way. So what we do is we utilize, we're multi-site in the aspect that it is TKC, Kissimmee, Holden Heights, whatever. But we utilize our influence to propel practitioners who want to plant. And so they will come to our church, be a part, grasp our church DNA, so to speak, and we will utilize our influence. And from the mother church, we will send them out with people and allow them to duplicate the work, even though it has a similar DNA, but it's different manifestations of that DNA. So multi site for you, yes. so that everyone's clear, it isn't you as the primary communicator Correct. simulcasting Correct. to your various locations. It is you as a local community nurturing, training, preparing yep. people who have gifts, calling, and character yep. for pastoral ministry, resourcing them not only through the training but also with people yes. to reach another part of the city or surrounding cities yes with a TKC presence. Correct. Now, are all of those churches that you are planting, are they TKC churches or are there no, other types of churches? Uh, we have TKC churches and now we're planting those that feel, hey, I, I just wanna do my own type ministry, got my own name, own vision. We will resource them as well. We have one that's starting in Tampa in August that we're resourcing to start. So our heartbeat is that uh, we can plan as many TKC cultural churches, where a church where you can come as you are, but you won't stay as you are, where it's, it, it ministers to the rich, the poor, the middle class. It, it really doesn't matter. Now, I, I want to park there for a minute because that some might miss, oh, they might miss the, the thought process that went yeah. into even a slogan like that, specifically um, in a culture that's kind of still accustomed to Sunday's best. Right. You know, I was I was looking at I was watching um, a live stream yes. of I'm not going to say the the pastor's name, but a very prominent pastor in the African American community, and I saw that they didn't have a suit on, yeah. and typically they don't yeah. do that during the summer, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. And yeah. but I was uh, it's winter, and I'm like yeah. they don't have on yeah. a suit, right. and I looked at some other videos, and I was like, oh, they don't they haven't right. had on a suit right. in three weeks, right. and I'm like, wow, this is he, this is huge. And I'm sitting saying, you know, we planted 13 years ago and I'm saying, I've been doing that for 13 years yeah. or not doing that. You know, I wear a suit when I get ready, I was, but not doing that for 13 years. And in certain contexts, people would, would say, what's the big deal about that? That's, that's regular. But with this history of Sunday's best and, and things of that particular nature, that's a different dynamic in the African-American community and some of the largest African-American churches Still, culturally, it's Sunday's best. But when churches are in the inner city, people don't understand right. the economic yeah. implications of that. And that's one of the things I realized when we were planting, because the first year of our church was in Trenton. Yes. And I started seeing these people don't own, some of these men don't own suits. They're not going to events that require suits. 
And that really became a barrier. Like people would literally, we would invite people to service and people would literally say, I don't have anything yeah. to wear. So this whole idea of come as you are and you won't stay as you are, is, is that framed and yeah let's talk a little bit about that my dad is a traditional southern baptist deacon slash quote unquote pastor we think uh yeah but he, right uh, yes because some of those yeah, are pastors yeah, right, in those right, kind of exactly. churches yeah, yeah, yeah he's one of those deacon. so he comes and i mean when i first started i was wearing my suits and he was like son um don't take your jacket off in the pulpit you know that those type of traditions <laughs> that we have in our culture and um, so we wanted to become both and. We wanted to let people know that you don't have to have a suit to come to church. But because I'm attracting millennials, I also wanted them to know that there will be certain places that require you to wear a suit. So I try to wear everything so that you can see yourself out of the four Sundays. You can see a place where you fit. Yeah, that is that is a huge, huge dynamic, too. I was um, one time I was having a conversation with a friend of mine. They passed in South Florida. So incredibly diverse area, and they have a very diverse church, um, but it's international diversity. I mean, they're in South Florida, so it's 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 amazing. And they were recently we were having a conversation. They had recently been to a church service, and it was another very prominent African American pastor there, and it was a ex professional football player that attended um, that service, and. And they were sitting next to this football player while this pastor was speaking. And the football player was like, speak, dad, preach, dad, preach, dad. And then uh, my friend said to me, <laughs> she said, you know, that was uh, the, the she said that was that was so cool. And when so I just started saying it, too. Preach, daddy. <laughs> preach, daddy. Preach, daddy. And I said, no, you probably shouldn't say that to another man. <laughs> Y'all was right there. And she's like, what does that mean? And I literally ex explained to her that one of the dominant metaphors in the New Testament yes. for the church is, is family. Yes. And uh, Paul even uses this spirit, a spiritual parenting metaphor to describe his role as a pastoral leader, as a spiritual parent. And one of the things that I said with her, I said, so in certain communities where there is, for whatever reason, a disproportionate number of people who are actually growing up with fathers in the home, the church really becomes a spiritual family for them. Yes. And the, the senior leader at times, or, or other leaders in those congregations, really become surrogate spiritual parents Absolutely. and have a responsibility, feel a, feel a responsibility beyond just teaching them yeah. theology, but also parenting them in a yeah. way that they're getting some of the life skills yeah. that some people would have got at home, they, they aren't getting. And so when people hear, okay, I wear this, I wear this, I wear this, I wear this in terms yeah. of the way you're Yes. You're you're doing that um, in terms of your attire. I know that's something I can relate to because in some communities, you not only have to show them um, how to wear suits right. by your example, yes. but what kind of suits to right. wear. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> what, yeah. I think that we are reparenters a lot of times in the inner city. We're, our job is not... Uh, just to preach and proclaim the gospel and minister the sacraments is also to fill in the gaps that they will never know the value of until someone steps in and fills them. Mm -hmm. So there are people, uh, I have a gentleman in my church, he's never been outside of Orlando. He, he the, the, yeah, the idea I hear that of all the time. vacation is like, I yes. never. So to expose him to another level of, because a lot of times people make limited decisions based on limited exposure. So a lot of times I feel like as a church, we bring in gifts and guests to expose our people's palate to want to have something deeper and a deeper appetite. Because I won't know what good is until you introduce me to something better than what I've currently mm -hmm. had. Mm -hmm. So my job as a leader is to always try to pre present things that will stretch their appetite and their imagination to dream. You know, one of the things I find a great appreciation in, in terms of your approach to yes. things like this, is your passion and conviction for the way that you do it, but it is without dogmatism. Yeah. Because even the way you approach, someone may be in, and there are people, I know of a couple yeah. of people, who may be in the same area, who take a different approach in terms of attire. Yeah. 
and they're still faithful and right. relevant and meeting the needs of people there. And, and I think that's kind of dangerous too when we attempt to superimpose a philosophy for, or, or an expression of mission on another church and say, this is the way that you serve. This is the way you serve the inner city. Yeah. This is the way you serve suburban America. And I think, um, I think the grace with which you handle your passion about what you do, yet have an appreciation for what others do. I think that is just incredible. Yeah, I, I try to be a hybrid. So I went to a Southern Baptist and a Reform seminary intentionally because I already knew about Southern Baptist doctrine. But I also want to be able to sit in the room and understand how you got to where you got. Mm -hmm. I may not have to agree with it, but I wanted to be able to be able to at least have a conversation without having the ability to say, I don't agree with you. I disagree with you but to be able to communicate and say, we may differ, but I know how you got there. Wow, that's great. Well, thank you so much for your time. Listen, we have people who are watching. Some may be going into parish or pastoral ministry. Some may eventually be church planners. Some may not. Uh, they just want to be, they want to live on mission. Yeah. And um, you know they're going to be a part of the church as a worshiping community and a witnessing community. So um, you've been doing this, how old is TKC, 11 years? 11 years. 11 years. So you've had 11 years of experience, school of hard knocks. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I tell people oftentimes when they, when they ask me about church planting, I said, you know, you planted a decade ago. You didn't plant a church. Yeah. You just started. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you just started because yeah. you know, most people don't know in in every unless unless something has happened recently that I'm not aware of. In every there isn't a African American denomination that I'm aware of yet that has developed a church planting arm. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That that is not to say that they don't plant churches. Right. Obviously, when you can look, you could look at. Every denomination at some point planted a church. The AMEs planted Church of God in Christ. But in terms of an, an arm of the denomination that nurtures, prepares, trains, and resources planters to plant, that's um that hasn't happened yet. And so we didn't we didn't plant. We just no, we, we started. started. Yeah, we, we so started. eleven years, <laughs> yeah. um, just some pastoral yeah. advice, what would you say to seminarians who are preparing for whatever their next is? I, I think one of the things that I would like to emphasize is this piece on authenticity. It's, it's so critical in the culture that we live in, we oftentimes sway to what we find is the phenomena. And oftentimes we lose ourselves in the process of trying to become in order to do. Yeah. And so I, I think one of the things that I would encourage you is, is to uh, it is important to have heroes in the faith. Uh, I am reminded of a scripture passage. I asked an older lady this this idea of how do you safeguard yourself from just being authentic to who you are? And she gave me this reference, I believe. It's in Judges. A young prophet comes along, and there's this older prophet that's been around a long time, and he gets a word from God that says, hey, listen, whatever you do, don't sit with anybody, don't associate with anybody. And he says, I hear you. And the older prophet comes and says, Listen, I've been doing this a long time. I'm, I'm a prophet like you. You need to sit and eat with me because I'm an older prophet. And because of his respect and his honor for the older prophet, he second guesses what God tells him to do. And he sits there and eats with the older prophet. Older prophet then says, you disobeyed God and then ends up having him eaten in the middle of the street by a lion. And so I say to you that there are a lot of times we have these heroes or these icons that we have in our faith community. And sometimes we negate what God is telling us because we're so passionately trying to become something that God never told us to become. So I would encourage you to be authentic to who God has made Very you. Good. And it may be different and you may be awkward and you may stand out because of the way that God told you to do it. But it may be a long way, but it is the right way. Yeah. Thank you so much for Thank your you. time. Thank you for Thank sharing you. that. Thank you for this investment in this class. So honor. Um, know you're busy and we appreciate it. And um, I believe that this investment is going to yield some fruit yes. that is going to serve us and serve the kingdom yes. well. Thanks a lot, my friend. Appreciate it.